Galatians chapter 3. Uh, you know, I will share a little bit since we're talking about this subject. Um, Ron and Sandy got me an alien up here. I guess this is a mascot of some kind, maybe. But um, I, uh, in doing some research for the Watchman broadcast, um, I came across a story about a woman who claims she has been, she doesn't really call it abduction because she went voluntarily with these aliens. Now, I don't know if she actually went into a ship or not, but what I know is these devils that came to her has filled her mind with some fantasies. And whether she actually went up in a ship or not, I have no idea. I know that she believes that she did. And uh, here's the thing. This woman claims to be a, a Christian. And it threw me. Because I've had people tell me that they've seen aliens. They call them devils or whatever. And when they brought the name Jesus up, those things left. Okay? And, um, and that's what we're dealing with. Don't, I don't believe that there are other civilizations waiting to contact us to bring us to a wonderful new age. Okay? I believe this book, and I believe they're devils. I believe they're gods, and they have an agenda, and they don't tell the truth. Um, they say they can see the future, and I don't believe that. Um, only God can do that. But anyway, she claims to be Christian, and this threw me because I'm just going... She had an experience where these things came in her house and she's like, she didn't, at first she didn't like them, but then she said, well, maybe they're angels. And the Bible says to entertain strangers for they may be angels unaware. So she's welcoming these little devils into her house and she willingly goes along with them. And the things that they showed her I'm going to reserve for the Watchman broadcast. I've kind of changed topics just a little bit because I'm going to deal with her story. Because she is the perfect candidate to blend Christianity in with the New Age. And the New Age is witchcraft. Pure and simple. Because she was taken to a place where she went behind this crystal door to see the one. And when pressed to tell what it was she saw, she says, I can't. And the guy's going, well, why can't you? Because they won't let me. Who won't let you? They won't. But the smile on her face, she was like enraptured by what she was seeing. And I read a little bit more about her last night. And basically, who she's talking about is the Antichrist. And she has equated this thing with God. And she has blended the New Age and the UFO movement in with Christianity. She's a setup. And people fall for it. They fall for this stuff. Because they don't know the truth. When you know the truth, you're free. Amen? So, Galatians chapter 3. Um, verse 1. Old foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? And this is the topic that we're dealing with. That you should not obey the truth before. And I want you to follow the, what Paul is saying here. Who bewitched you? Who came in, taught you these, these lies, cursed you to believe this stuff? When Peter said that they'll bring in damnable heresies. The heresies themselves are damnable. And those that believe them are damned. You're doomed to believe this stuff. And that's what Paul's... Who, who bewitched you? Who cast a spell over you? That you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. 
And I started on this last Sunday, Exodus twenty two eighteen. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. God was very serious about this stuff. He did not want it in his people. We talked about the TV show, Bewitched, and Aunt Clara, whose problem was she didn't use the right words. Witchcraft forces you to perform a ritual and get it all correct, or the power won't show up. And you must say the right words, and you must say them uh, with the right force, because the universe is going to answer your request. That's what they believe, the four elements of the universe, which... Let me get into this a little bit. They use what's called elemental powers. Earth, air, fire, and water. And these are all opposites to each other. Fire and water are opposites. Earth and air are opposites. And these four elements are driven and empowered by four watchtowers. And these four watchtowers have four elemental spirits that guard over them. And these spirits are dragons. Dun, dun, dun. So what does that tell you? That tells you that these are devils that are part of this. And these dragons, these, this one witch said, you got to be careful now when you're summoning these dragons because they may be asleep. And when I read that, I immediately thought the day that Elijah had his showdown with the 400 prophets of Baal, that's what Elijah said. Where's Baal? Is he sleeping? He needs to be wakened up. And so these witches believe that you must handle these dragons carefully when you summon them, because if you wake them up abruptly, they might get mean on you. And I'm going, I think my version of prayer is a lot better than theirs. Because number one, my God never sleeps. He does not slumber nor sleep. And he's always there to listen to me when I pray. Now, I'm going to preach a message this morning about prayer. And about one of the, I think, the most important key to understanding your prayers with God. Okay? It's a very simple thing, but it's something we don't like. It's called waiting. Waiting. We have microwave ovens that put food out to us quicker. We want emails instead of snail mails. We want faster downloads. We want faster Amazon packages to come to us. We want it delivered today or tomorrow if we can get it. We want everything the quick way. And God has a time and a season for everything under the sun. And so anyway, but this is, this is witchcraft at its core. The idea that you pronounce spells, you cast spells, you must perform rituals, they must be done in a correct fashion, and that the universe can only understand a certain language that you must speak to them. Um, I talked about this last Sunday, so I won't get into that. Um, turn to 2 Kings 9. And let me say this, witchcraft is a religion predominantly dominated by women. And the, in some ways, that's how you can recognize it. Um, Saul was delivered over to witchcraft. He sought out a woman that had a familiar spirit. Second Kings chapter 9, Jehu, who was by no means no righteous man, and uh, that tells you that get there that God doesn't need sometimes the righteous people to do what he wants. God can get whoever to do what he wants. Second Kings chapter 9, uh, Jehu comes riding up and he's on his way to Jezebel. He's on his way to get her. And verse 22, it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Jezebel was a, she's a type of mystery Babylon the great. That harlot spirit, you see it woven all through the scriptures. You have Jezebel, you have Herodias, you have uh, Delilah. Any, any woman in the Bible who is 
a terror to authority. She despises biblical authority. She is a practitioner, worshiping the gods, things like that. That is all a type of mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And God said witchcraft back in Deuteronomy 18 was an abomination. So wherever she, her spirit is, there's going to be witchcraft. There's going to be consulting with familiar spirits. Um, man, I could talk about that. First Samuel 15. First Samuel 15. In fact, let's turn there. Let's, let's dwell there for a little bit. Let's, let's look at uh, Saul and why Samuel said this. Saul was... Man, when he started out, he was great. He was prophesying. He was a humble man. And God was using him. Then it got, you was talking about pride. Saul got full of pride. And he let the authority of being a king go to his head. What is it they say? Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what, that's what happened with Lucifer. It's what happened with Saul. He got pride, he got arrogant, and he felt like he could do no wrong. And that what he did, even though it disobeyed God, he justified what he did. He was supposed to go in and kill everybody, including the king, and not take anything from those people. So he goes in, all of a sudden, there's all these sheep coming back. And he's got the king in custody. And he thinks that because they're going to sacrifice some of the sheep, that that should appease God somehow, even though he disobeyed God. And God said, I'm not going to take it. So in, um, let's go to, um, oh, let's see here, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He's lying through his teeth. He's lying through his teeth. Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you obeyed God, then why do I hear sheep? Because you weren't supposed to bring anything back. You were supposed to slaughter it all. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. In other words, you got rid of the junk and you saved the best for yourself. Saul wasn't fooled, or Samuel wasn't fooled. God wasn't fooled either. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. Samuel had been up all night. He was weeping all night because God told him, I'm going to reject him. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, thou wast not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? His covetousness. He coveted what he saw. Same thing with Lucifer. He coveted God's throne. And so, verse 20, now Sam, Saul's going to protest. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalek. Amalekites. God told him to kill the king, not bring him back. That was his trophy. He wanted everybody to see what he'd done. But the people, now he's blaming it on the people. The people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And I want you to think about, I want every, everybody to listen to me. Those who are in authority, if God has put it in your hand to do what's right, do what's right. Because even if those under you are going to disobey, it's ultimately your decision, your choice. You're the one in charge. And those people kept those sheep because Saul allowed them to. Saul could have said, if I see anybody with any of the Amalekite sheep, I'm going to cut your head off. And they would have obeyed him because they feared the king. But Saul let them do it. And so he was trying to put it on everybody else what he had done. And this is, this is the wicked nature of mankind. 
is to cover up, bury our own sins, hide them someplace, or pin them on everybody else, and we can do no wrong. That was Saul. And he went from being this godly man to a liar because of his pride. And so verse 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord a great, as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, I don't have this in my notes, I don't think, but there's a list of 13 principles that Wiccans live by. Can you imagine that number 13? It's there. It's on purpose. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words, all big capital letters for you. They circled Jericho 13 times. One time a day, six days, six days, seven times on the seventh day. It's 13. Jericho is a type of Babylon that falls. Okay. That number 13, Deuteronomy 13, Acts 13, Revelation 13. You see it all through the scriptures. God ties these things together for you. Okay. And so, um, well, that was good. Where was I going with it? Oh, these 13 principles that Wiccans believe. Number six is as Wiccans, we do not believe that we are under any hierarchical authority. In other words, we don't obey anybody's rules. Aleister Crowley said, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That is the exact opposite of the two commandments Jesus gave us to live by. Love the Lord our God with all our heart and love our neighbor as thyself. But Crowley and witchcraft turns it around and says, do what you want first. That's your law. Whatever you want, you should get. Now, tell me that that principle is not in Joel Osteen's philosophy. You get what you want. Your best life now. You, you must live life to the fullest. You must get everything you want out of it. Him and Joyce Myers, same thing. It's witchcraft. By the way, Joyce Myers had a religion before she got into church work. She was a witch. She was an astrologer and a witch. And her salvation, who remembers when you got saved? The day that God poured out the whole of the law on you and you were guilty under God's penalty and you came to the cross begging God's mercy and forgiveness for your sins. Remember that? That's not how Joyce got saved. She saw a vision of Jesus calling her to preach to the masses. And that was her con so-called conversion. Okay? She is still practicing witchcraft in a more subtle form. Because she, Joel Osteen, and all these others teach that you have power with your words. That you can create wealth. You can create health. You can create your own universe by speaking it. She wrote a book called The Answer is Right Under Your Nose. And she's talking about the mouth. And most everything that she says has to do with the power of your words that you can create whatever you want. It's based upon a witchcraft principle called the law of attraction. The law of attraction is taught in businesses, it's taught in Amway, it's taught in schools, it's taught all over the world that if you want good things, you must attract those things to you by thinking positive thoughts and saying positive words. How many times have you ever heard Joel Osteen talk about sin or hell or condemnation? Never, never. You know why? He believes that if he says hell, that it causes people to go to hell because he proclaimed it. 
If he says things like, you will die in your sins, that will cause people to die in their sins because he proclaimed it with his mouth. So you will, and I'm not kidding you. I'm not making this up. That's what he believes. That's witchcraft. Because he believes that he can put a curse by using the words of his mouth. And so here's rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Saul turned against the word of God. He turned against the Bible, by the way. So what did it get him? Uh, where is it? I don't have it in my notes. Turn to Nahum chapter 3. We know that Saul eventually ended up because the Bible said that God would no more speak to Saul by the prophets or by visions or by Urim and Thummim. God stopped speaking to Saul. So Saul was going to go to battle the next day and he wanted to know whether or not he was going to live through it. So because God will not speak to him any longer, he goes to seek out someone who has a familiar spirit. And her name was, she was from Endor. What was Samantha's mother's name in the show, Bewitched? Endora. Where did they get that name from? Got right out of the Bible. The witch of Endor. Saul goes to this woman and he says, he goes in disguise because he's issued a proclamation before that there be no one who has a familiar spirit in all the land or he'd kill him. That was the good Saul. Now the evil Saul's going to the very thing that he condemned. And he goes to this woman in disguise and he says, I want you to bring me somebody up by the familiar spirit. And so all of a sudden, this woman jumps back. She sees this image before her with a mantle over his head, an old man. Saul said, what did you see? And she said, I saw gods coming up out of the earth. That's not the spirit of dead people. They don't come back and talk to people. It's a familiar spirit. It is a devil who just happens to know stuff about your Uncle Fred. Knows the combination of the lockbox, knows where the key is, knows where the will is. Knows what Aunt May used to like, whatever. He knows all of that stuff because he's familiar with the people. And so this one comes up. And there's an argument, some say it really was Samuel. I do not agree with that because the Bible specifically says that God was not going to talk to him any longer by the prophets. That's who Samuel was. So this familiar spirit comes up posing as Samuel. The Bible says Saul perceived that it was Samuel. It was the anti-Samuel. Right. Another Samuel. But not Samuel. Okay, you see, you see where all this goes? See what it teaches us? A spirit is going to rise up in this world and say, I'm Jesus. And it's not Jesus. It's not going to be Jesus. Most people are going to fall for it. So my, my question to everybody always is, will you? Will you fall for it? The best way to not fall for it is to know who the real Jesus is. You'll be able to recognize him when he appears and will say, uh, that's not Jesus. It's not him. This lady that I'm talking about was introduced. She said that she saw the one, the creator, face to face. That's a lie. You can't see God and live. She not only says she saw him, but she was trying to draw. There's in her latest book she wrote a couple years ago. She drew out something that she says was similar to what she saw, but she could not describe what she saw. During one of the hypnosis sessions that they had with her she would often speak in an unintelligible language and when when she was asked what it was she was saying she would say well i know what it is but i can't say it why can't you say it 
because we don't have the words in our language to say what they're saying. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. She still to this day claims to be a Bible-believing Christian. Okay? And what I read last night nails it for me. I know she's not. Because she is mingled. She's mingled Gnosticism that God created emanations of himself so that he could create us, which is Gnosticism, which is essentially what Jehovah's Witness believed. Jehovah's Witness believed that Jesus is not God. God created a lesser God so that that God could create this world. Okay? And it goes all the way back to the heresies that were around in the days of Paul in the early church. Wow. Wow. That stuff is rising back up again, and it's related to witchcraft. Um, during certain hypnotic sessions, she was supposed to be like 30, 40 years in the past, and all of a sudden, a strange voice would come out of her mouth. And the hypnotist recognized that the aliens were there in the room with them speaking through her. That's a woman that hath a familiar spirit. That's the woman at Endor that Saul went to. She has devils. And I feel, I feel bad for her. I ended up praying for her last night. God, she's still alive. Cause her to come out of this and realize where she's been if she's not already been turned over to this. I feel bad for her. Nahum, chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city, verse 1. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheels, of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Here's why. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts. He's speaking of the bloody city, which is Babylon the Great. Babylon's clothed in scarlet. And she has a cup in her hand. And in that cup is the blood of the martyrs for Jesus Christ. And it's full of the filthiness of her abominations and her whoredoms. And she pours that cup out to the nations to make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. Folks, the, the top two sins of America is drunkenness fornication and I wouldn't put them in that necessarily order fornication and drunkenness and they always go hand in hand when you find one you'll find the other and our nation is full of that spirit it's everywhere including churches including churches the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. As I said earlier, years ago, I used to read a lot of comic books. And this ad was in many of them. The magic power of witchcraft. And it was a draw to me at a... At a time in my life. I was going to church here, reading comic books, but wanting to have magic powers. It was a lure. And I, I said, if I would have had a dollar, which I didn't get many of those, because Tooth Fairy only left a quarter in my day. But if I got a dollar, and I thought my mom wouldn't find it in the mailbox, I might have ordered that. I think God said, I'm not giving you a dollar. That's just all there is to it. 
And I will have your mama find out. Because she found out everything. Okay? But that was, that was a draw to me. And we have families all over this country. They can be going to church. And their children practicing witchcraft. Because their pastor told them to read Harry Potter. Said it was a good book. Their pastor said to do that. Galatians 5. Notice the list of the works of the flesh that Paul has gathered together for us. In Galatians 5, he's going to later on, he's going to give the nine fruits of the Spirit. By the way, we go back to Deuteronomy 18, there's nine forbidden practices. And they're the opposite of these fruits of the Spirit. See, God will give you love, real love, giving kind of love where you love God where you do things for God and you don't expect God to give anything back to you that's love you're serving God you you tithe not thinking that God owes you something now because you did it he didn't owe you anything what you had you got from him to begin with okay you give because you want to give that and the spirit put that in you to love the Spirit put it in you to love people unconditionally. To love a wife. To love a husband. To love children. Unconditionally. No matter what they do. No matter how rotten they turn out. You love them anyway. And you never stop praying for them. Amen. So here's the works of the flesh. There's 18 of those. That's 6 plus 6 plus 6. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lascivious. The top four deal with dirty sins. Fornication, lasciviousness. People all the time having a dirty thought about everything. Telling dirty jokes about everything. Making dirty comments about everybody and everything. Cannot cease from it. And then idolatry. Then number six is witchcraft. Near the top of the list, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. That's a sin. To worry about what everybody else has. That has also pervaded this nation. And you've got people who run their mouth all the time on TV who are all about class envy or race envy. They're trying to stir up envy. Oh, look at these people. These Fortune 500 types. They have all the money. While all the working people have nothing. Listen. When you're saved and you're right with God. You just go about your work. And it's not you that's blessing yourself. It's God that's doing it. And when you have God blessing you. It doesn't matter what everybody else has. But see, that's what they're trying to stir up with everybody in this country. Oh, look what all they have. They've got all the money. We have nothing. We're going to... And it's all about stealing what they've got. And giving it out to everybody. That's envying. And God said it's a sin. It's a work of the flesh. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. Oh, what, what party are you going to tonight? Well, we went for one party. We got kicked out of that. So we're going to another one. And they party every weekend's a big party to them. Revelings. Never, you've got men never stay at home at night. I knew a guy worked with him. He would get off work, drive all the way down to Farmington, get dropped off, leave and go to the pool hall while his wife and his three kids are at home. Where's daddy? Daddy's at the pool hall. And he'd come home one or two o'clock in the morning drunk every night. Get up four the next morning, come in with a hangover and go to work. And then next thing I know, I come in, Woody's like, oh, my wife kicked me out. Really? Didn't see that coming, did you? And it's only like the third time. And he said, you think she'll have me back? I said, Woody, I don't know. I don't know if she'll ever have you back. I think that I would get my life right with God, stay out in pool halls and show your wife that you'll be a good father to the children. You'll be a good husband to her. She might let you back. So you come in one day with plan B. Plan B was. I found me a new woman at the pool hall. The 
revelings and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And it should not surprise you people that where you find one of these, you will more than likely find others. Others, witchcraft included. Families, churches, you name it. This is where we're going next Sunday. This is the Harry Potter Bible study. In jo- yeah. You see his jaws going like. Harry Potter Bible study. Fi- enjoying God through the final four Harry Potter movies. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Do you know who the Phoenix is? It's the Antichrist. It's the Antichrist. Because he's a spirit, he's got wings, he's a spirit, and he dies in the flames. Where's the, where's the beast right now? He's down there. And out of the ashes, he rises from the dead. Okay? And I almost bet you, that they will portray the phoenix as Christ risen from the dead. He's not. Christ didn't die in flames. He did not burn in hell. He preached there. Half-blood prince, deathly hallow. This is, this is witchcraft taught in Sunday school rooms, vacation Bible schools, church youth functions all over the country. That's where we're going next week. That spirit, yep. Yeah. Got a mark. I saw Satan fall as lightning. And that's what's marked on his forehead. I'm going, could you be more obvious? Yeah. Yeah. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Pan, Pan is in that. Pan is half human, half beast, and he's a fornicator, big time. No discernment. No discernment because nobody reads the Bible anymore. They read the wrong one too. Father in heaven, keep us. Keep us. Don't let us go. Don't let us fall into temptation. Don't let us fall for the lies, the deceit, the lasciviousness. Do not turn us over like you did with Saul. David begged you after his sin with Bathsheba, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Father, that's our prayer to you today. The devil is so subtle and so evil. He has pervaded churches and pastors everywhere. And they don't see it. They can't see it. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. But Father, open our eyes. We can see the effects even of our own lasciviousness, of our own covetousness, our own pride. Take that from us and chastise us, Father. Correct us, Father, with love so that we are your sons indeed. Help us, Father. Give us light from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.